And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Rodney Jones, jazz musician and faculty at Juilliard. He's a longtime student of Ekankar teaching and for decades has sung Hugh, an ancient mantra and sacred sound for spiritual upliftment and connection to God, which we will learn about today. Rodney, thank you so much for being my guest and welcome. Thank you. It's my privilege and honor to be here and with all your guests as well. Thank you. Uh, Rodney, recently I had a guest who sang Hugh after a terrible car accident, and I decided to reach out and have you come teach us how to sing Hugh, as well as um, if you can give us some basic information on Ekankar. So if you don't mind, can we start with your own personal experience and journey with singing Hugh? Sure. Uh, You know, in order to talk about that, I'll roll back the clock even further. You know, a picture, if you will, a six-year-old boy in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, where I was growing up at the time. And uh, as young boys do, I had a jar and went outside around my house collecting spiders. And I collected, oh, I don't know, many, many spiders, you know, 15, 20 spiders in a jar. And uh, I put the jar down and went to do something. And my mother called me or something. When I came back, just about all the spiders were dead. They had being territorial and being confined in a small space, all the spiders had killed them, killed each other. And I remember holding that jar up to the sunlight and having this thought, like as a, you know, it's remarkable to think I was six years old, but I remember it so clearly. I held it up to the light and I said, they were alive and now they're dead. Is that all there is to life? And that really began to propel me forward in really looking for what does it all mean? What's the why of my life? You know, why am I born in this circumstance? Why is the world the way it is? Why are my parents who they are? Why do I have likes and dislikes and that sort of thing? Uh, You know, moving forward years later, I uh, found out about the hue and I said, well, you know, I'll try it. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I, I did it, and I found uh, an ever-widening uh, expanse within myself opening up of, of freedom. It felt, I felt free in a way that I didn't feel, and I felt, uh, I felt a deeper understanding about the why of my life. Now, there's many, many stories that, that go along with that, um, but I found the hue to be a resource. I learned about the hue in, in the you know, in the path of Ekankar, the path of spiritual freedom, that's where I first heard about it. Uh, you know, and then I discovered having traveled to, you know, all over Africa and Asia and Europe, and, you know, that um, the hue had been known in cultures down throughout time. I mean, that wasn't, it wasn't the property of anyone. It was this tool, this this gift, if you will, that has had been... Uh, shared that was known to many, many cultures. When I was in Ghana, they, they sung Hue. And I was shocked at that. And I went to Japan and they also used Hue. And and uh, it was really surprising. You know, Hue was one of the names of one of the Norse gods. And it was also known in Egypt. And I, I just thought it was really interesting. And so then it began first my interest in Hue and then most importantly, how it would affect me and my personal journey as a you know, as a father of four and as a professional musician, as a teacher. uh, And it's been instrumental in all the things that I have done. Uh, And it particularly, it helped me to really understand um, some past life experiences that I've had. And I'll I'll share one of those, for example. Um, All my life, I had a, a, a deep fear of water like beyond fear, like really a hatred of water. Like I would see a swimming pool or river and there was this palatable feeling of like, stay away, danger, I, 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 I hate it. You know, I would ask my parents, I don't want to be around that. And if I, were, if I was at camp, I never wanted to participate. And, and it was uh, really odd, you know, really odd thing. My parents, uh, growing up in New York City uh, from the age of eight, they put me in uh, in a Columbia University had a, a program 
teach your child to swim. And they said, well, you know, son, it would be great for you to learn how to swim. We're going to put you in this program. And I didn't want to do it, but they made me go. And two weeks in, the teachers had no progress. And so Columbia said, well, we're going to bring in the world leading expert. He's coming to do a workshop. We're going to have all our students come. And over three weeks, he's going to teach your son to swim. And you'll see. He's the, the leading expert. He had written books on this topic, subject. Three weeks later, he, he had failed. I didn't want anything to do with water. Nothing like that. And that was really odd. You know, it was, it was like I say, it wasn't just fear of water. It was hatred of water. And so one evening, years later, maybe I was 18 or 19, I, I decided, you know, what is that about? Why is that? What? Why? Why that? Why haven't I learned to swim? Why am I so afraid of water? And I uh, sat on the edge of the bed and I sung "Hugh," which I'll demonstrate after the end of the story. And uh, then I just went to sleep. And I asked, I said to spirit or God, however you want to think of it, the best question I've ever found ever to say, which is, "What would you like to show me?" Because rather than me defining the experience or picking hole and say, I want to learn about this thing in this way, I wanted spirit to have the widest possible lens to offer anything. Maybe I want to learn about, you know, swimming and maybe I needed to know about nutrition. So I wanted to leave it open that way. And I, it led to me having a series of dreams, uh, Jeff. And uh, in these dreams, I was in England in what could have been the, 1700s or early 1800s and I was now in the roll back a little bit at six or seven years old I knew the word limnologist you ever heard of that limnologist yeah no who has limnologist right I knew this word limnologist limnologist I said I want to be a limnologist limnologist and you know later I discovered that that's a person who studies ponds and inland streams very specific fresh water only no salt water you know so rolling forward. So I had these dreams where I'm on the River Thames in England and I loved my life. I would go out on the boat and I would research small animals and snails and salamanders and newts and turtles and frogs and I just loved my life. I was filled over a course of several nights with this recurring dream of just having the most beautiful, wonderful life. I mean, it was just idyllic in every way. And I remembered then one night, I reached over to, to grab a turtle or something and the boat tipped over. And I fell into the water. And I felt myself being sucked down. Because I had on, I guess, whatever heavy, not heavy clothing, but, you know, jackets with pockets looking like an explorer type of thing. And I remember thinking... This water is taking everything I love from me. I love my life. I love what I'm doing. This is the best life. And this water is taking it all away from me. I, I hated the water for taking my life away. I drowned. And so I, I realized upon waking up, that was the source of my hatred of water. Why it went beyond just a child being afraid of, I don't know how to swim, to hating it. That there was this visceral sense that water had taken something so precious away from me. And by singing Hugh and working with that, it helped me bring that fear and hatred into the present moment and release it. I was no longer a prisoner to that past life experience. I no longer hated the water. I understand. I understood. And by feeling it, I was able to release it. I didn't even know it was there. But by having it resurface, I could let it go. And I could turn uh, grief into gratitude. I could be grateful for that life, for the gifts that it offered, for what I had gained, for the love, and for the fact that I had brought into this life this love, which remains to this day of aquariums and small animals and ponds. I mean, if I drive anywhere where there's a stream, it's a visceral pull to want to pull over to the side of the road and go there. It's like, it's all my life it's that way, you know? And uh, so that was really important. And I did finally learn how to swim. Hold your applause. But I did finally <laughs> learn, I did finally learn how to swim. Albeit very poorly, 
<laughs> you know, I'm a very poor swimmer. But the thing is, I learned to love the water and to turn that kind of grief into gratitude. You know, to and that's all a direct result of Hugh opening this doorway to this awareness. You know, I, my father was a Christian minister for for sixty years, and we talked one time, and I said, you know, Dad, do you think, uh, you know, what do you think about dreams and and that kind of thing? He said, oh, I don't really pay much attention to that. I said, well, you know, do you think God goes to sleep when you do? He said, no, God is always God. He said, but do you think, does God speak to you in your in your daily life? He said, well, yes, of course. I said, do you think God could be speaking when you're asleep too? He's like, hmm, I never thought of that. And then he began to pay attention to his dreams. Well, that was an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that with us. At what age were you when you first started singing, Hugh? Twelve. Hmm. Uh, I had uh, always been interested in any kind of spiritual books. My dad being a, a minister and a great theologian, you know, a student of religion and, and a wonderful man of God, just the most, the most amazing soul I'd ever met, you know, uh, had many books about all different types of things, uh, mostly traditional religions, but he had a few other things, you know, and, and books by a gentleman named Howard Thurman, who was a Christian mystic, who's, who took the mystical side of Christianity, if you will. And, and um, that led me, we went to a mall one time. And I went to the, the mall. I was looking for a, uh, a book on numerology. This is 12 years old. I'm like, oh, if I could learn some more about numbers, how, you know, because the lens of a 12 year old, how cool would that be, you know? And uh, there was a book on the shelf called Ekinkar Key to Secret Worlds. It was written by the modern day founder of Ekinkar, a gentleman named Paul Twitchell, uh, who was a master compiler of spiritual tools and techniques. He went throughout the world and, and said, what? do all the world's religions and teachings have if you take away the cultural trappings away from them. If you take the, the, the country, you take the the religious traditions, if you take uh, the cultural traditions, if you take those things out of the mix, what's left? And he found that, well, what's left in, in virtually all religions are references to light, whether it's light or candle burning or, or an inner light. And sound, the singing of songs, the singing of chants, mantras, hymns, that these were two qualities that were were found in all of the world's teachings and, and that were present, whether it's through recitation of prayer or, or mantras or whatever, or, or contemplation or meditation. And, and uh, so anyway, I read this book and it, it talked about the hue, you know, uh, and, and singing it and really seeing what's happening, not telling you what it's going to do, but saying if you sing it, it's a way to find a deeper answer, to find the answer for yourself of what you're you're seeking. And so at 12, I didn't really know. I mean, who knows what I was seeking? A baseball bat. I don't know what I was looking for at 12. Um, but I sung it and had some experiences. I remember singing it. Um, there was an exercise that said, if you place your attention on a, like you're a dot on the ceiling and place your attention there while you're saying, Hugh, that if you tra practice that, suddenly you may find you're on the ceiling looking back at your body. And that happened to me. And I remember thinking to myself, that's me. And I said, no, wait, that can't be me. I'm me. Who's that looking at my body? And that was the first time I really had this idea, this sense of being out of my body, like that I was a soul with a body, not a body that had a soul. And that was the first moment. That was the 12. Well, naturally, I didn't know a lot to do with that. But it did propel my continued interest in spirituality. That's the first time I learned about you by singing it and having an experience. All right. Well, if you don't mind, teach us how to sing you. I will. I, I'm happy to. Um, here again, the, the hue is a, it's an ancient word. You know, as a musician that I am, it, you know, I'm always interested in this, the, the root sound, the, the seed sound, the core tonality, the, the basic harmony, the most fundamental part of any piece of music or any sound. And the hue is this sound of spirit as it flows through the world, as it flows through us. It, it's this sound that um, really is the atoms of spirit moving. Uh, it's also a, a doorway. It op for me, it has opened a doorway into 
my own inner landscape, understanding the why of my life, why things are as they are, and connecting to first my passion in life, which is music, and then connecting to my purpose in life, which is much deeper, which is to unfold spiritually and, and learn, you know, who am I, why am I here, who am I, and whose am I, and what does it all mean for me. Um, so the hue is, is something that uh, offers to each person a chance to experience a deeper love and a deeper connection that already is there. You know, it's a way of listening louder. It's an exercise I do with, with the students at school. You know, I say, okay, listen to a piece of music. Now we're going to turn the volume of the music down really softly. And rather than make the music louder so you can hear more, you're going to raise your attention to listen louder. And it's amazing that when students do that, they hear more in the music than if the music was very loud because their attention is heightened. Singing cue is that sort of thing. It's a relaxing, enjoyable thing done with the, the curiosity and expectation of a, of a child. You don't have to uh, imagine anything or, or make any you know, uh, declarations if you don't want to. You, you're welcome to do that if you like. If you have a spiritual guide that you work with, whoever it is, you're welcome to invite them as part of that. But it's really a way of just opening up the heart to this presence of spirit and seeing what it would like to offer, what spirit would like to offer. Uh, one thing I'll say is it's really good, I found, to begin by putting my attention on something I love because I want love to be at the, the center of the journey. I want that to be the connective tissue of what I'm going to experience. Um, and basically you put your attention on your spiritual eye here, the space between your eyebrows, and you can close your eyes or sing with your eyes open. And hue is spelled H-U. It's pronounced hue like, the, like the, a boy's name, hue. And it's sung in a long drawn out tone on the outgoing breath, like hue. It can be sung at any kind of tone. It can be sung at, sung at any pace um, in whatever way you're comfortable doing. It can be sung silently or out loud if you're alone. Uh, and then after, you, after I've sung you for a few moments, then I will sit uh, and see what spirit would like to offer. Now, sometimes the experiences could be an inner light. I could see an inner light in my inner vision. It could be a blue light, a white light, a, you know, it could be a feeling of peace. It could be an answer to a question. It could be really anything that spirit wants to provide, you know, depending on what you need and what you'd like. Earlier, you said, okay, what do you want to show me? Yes. Before every time you do that, do you always ask that question? I do, but that's not part of what anyone has to do. You know, everyone should, should come to that sacred space inside themselves in whatever way they're most comfortable. I, that's the language that I use for myself. What would you like to show me? But, you know, someone else could come and say, thy will be done. Or someone else could say, you know, speak to me, God, or, or I'm here for you, Spirit, or whatever works, or nothing. You could come and say, I'm, I'm entering this place in silence. That's, that's what, there's no, you know, prescribed way that you have to do that. It really is learning your own soul language, learning the way that God speaks to you learning the way that spirit speaks to you, decoding that, experiencing that, and, and trusting that. And that's going to be different for each of us. Do you have your attention on anything while you're doing it? I could. But most of the, most of the time, you know, contemplation as opposed to meditation, if we're going to, this is really a contemplative exercise. Meditation, in my understanding, and as I've done it, is really sitting still and doing nothing, becoming still and contemplation can be sitting still and keeping the attention aware as opposed to letting it just broaden keeping the attention aware and for example if there's an inner light you can experience the inner light you can also move into it you can actually have volition and decide you know I want to see where the light is coming from where is that you know where is where's the origin of light moving towards that source um, but here again um, each person can can do that for themselves. You can ask specific questions. You can visualize 
a, a spiritual guide or, or love or a beautiful scene. Um, it's really for each person to find how it works for you. It's a tool to use to discover the way that divine spirit speaks to each of our hearts individually. So it sounds like to me, while you're doing it, it doesn't matter what your mind is doing. You don't have to be focusing on the sound hue or focusing on your third eye or anything. You can just kind of sing hue and let your mind wander. Yeah, I, I guess I guess it's kind of like, you know, if you've ever watched a movie that was no good, a half an hour seems like a three-hour movie. And if you've ever watched a movie that was great, a three-hour movie seems like it goes by in a half an hour. And so the idea for me when I think you is to become interested in what's going on. I, I, I watch the scene. I participate by watching and, and, and seeing and become being interested in, in what's present and then just being open, but it could be stillness. It's really each according to whatever we need. Hmm. Um, you, you can have specific, you could sing you and say, I want to go to an inner temple or I want to meet this spiritual teacher or I want to thank you and just experience a deeper peace or I want to thank you to experience you know answer to a question those are all fine it's really whatever you and that can change you could do one one week and one one time and do something else the next time but it's not a concentration thing where you're trying to hold an image of something and you know or trying to still the mind so the thoughts go by and like stop you know stop it's more like you're watching it like it's a, for me I watch it like it's a movie like it's a show and gradually, it, it gradually thins out for me where I'm just present. And that is where a lot of fun begins. Can you sing Hue in a group? Sure. I mean, there are, even online, Hue songs, I believe, and, and um, resources. A wonderful resource. If you go to giftofhue.org, um, there's a Hue app. You can download it from the Apple App Store, I believe. It may be for Android as well. It's just a Hue app from Ekinkar. And you can listen and sing along with thousands of people singing Hue. And it's a very uplifting sound, even just to play it in the background or to sing along. That way it's not just you, you know, in your room by yourself. And see, you see that feeling, experience that feeling. But yeah, Hue can be sung in a group as well. Not in unison. Everyone doesn't happen to sing in the same pace. Everyone can sing in the way that's comfortable for them. It's a rolling Hue. Um, but yeah, the Hue app is a wonderful resource that anyone can check out and it's free. I was kind of basing my ideas on Hue from my previous guest. And I believe when he was doing it, he was like singing love to God. So I wasn't sure if you should be singing to God or giving emotion or trying to feel love for God while doing it. Well, absolutely. I mean, it is a love song to God in the sense that it's opening our, it opens the heart to receive these, this gift of spirit, whatever it is for each of us. I mean, if I were in, you know, a critical car accident, absolutely, I would be seeking guidance and want help with that situation. And that's, you know, healing is another aspect, you know, insight is another aspect, balance is another aspect. Those are all completely legitimate reasons. It just depends on what you need. Um, it is a love song to God and, you know, one sings it with, I sing it with reverence and gratitude, really, um, gratitude for my life, for the gift of life, you know, gratitude for that gift. I, I sing it with that, um, because although I, you know, I'm a musician, I can, you know, have trained my hands. I can't create my hands. I didn't create them. You know, I, I, I did, I don't give them volition. That that's, I, I'm grateful for the gifts that my life has and, and, um. So it is a love song to it's God. It's a way of connecting, you know, in the deepest, most profound way with the, within ourselves to this flow of love that comes from the heart of all creation and flows down through all creation. How that plays out in an individual basis depends. Sometimes, sometimes that's the experience. It, it feels like that. And sometimes it comes as insight or sometimes it might come as silence. Love, you know, doesn't have one particular type of definition where it's like, Love feels like this. Love could be silence. Love could be peace. Love could be stillness. Love could be an answer to a question. Love could be many forms. I know as a parent, you know, um, you know, love was oftentimes getting up at six in the morning and making breakfast with my kids. That was love. They didn't see it that way. It's like dad's doing what he's doing. But for me to pull myself out of the bed at six, that was love. So 
it, you know, it just depends on the orientation. But generally speaking, the reason I, I don't frame it that way right now is because not everybody is using the same language and the same terminology and the hue is for everyone. So someone that is, is, you know, doesn't feel particularly loving and doesn't have that sense of reverence towards God, but still wants to get answers to questions and insights into their journey can use hue in that way. It, it reveals itself. It, it peels the layers of the onion from within gradually. And so there's no pressure that I have to be in a particular state of reverence to sing you or I have to be pious to sing you. We're all worthy and able to sing you. It is a love song, but it's a love song that speaks to each of us individually according to what we need and what, and what we want. I had been thinking that in a lot of traditional religions, it seems that um, it wants people to worship God. I'm not sure if God's seeking worship, but that's what it appears. And it seemed like to me that Hugh just offering love back through singing is something different than, than worshiping. It's like an offer of love back. And, and also what made me think about that is that I've had so many guests that have had near-death experiences and that on the other side they experience so much love that's even, they say, ineffable. It's just indescribable. So maybe when we're doing Hugh, you're kind of just offering a little bit of love back to God and that offering you're rewarded with whatever you get from this. I think that's right. I think it's a relationship. And it's learning to listen. You know, if you talk to God and say, God, you help me with this. But the practice of learning to listen to the answer that God gives back. The hue facilitates that listening louder, that hearing the answer, hearing the answer back. Um, yeah, I mean, your insights uh, and observations are 100% correct. The hue is not, you know, I mean, I think for me, the greatest worship I can give to God is by being a really good steward of the life I've been given. You know, to serve, you know, I believe that, that each of us, I know that each of us are soul. You know, I heard your previous guest say that. And I, I also have had a near-death experience, which I can share. Um, and I realized, no, I'm a soul with a body. You know, I, that's that, and that at the end of my journey, there's only love. There's only this all-encompassing um, love of God for for each one of us. That there is no worthiness to be loved. That each of us is love. We are loved. We, the, we, I can forget that, but that doesn't change that that's what I am. And the hue has reconnected me to that initial intention and that initial awareness that, no, I, I am love and that there is love. I, I'll, I'll share the story and, you know, uh, one of the stories. Uh, I had, maybe 25 years ago, uh, severe case of double pneumonia you know the doctor told me at the time i'm i'm one day away from being dead that's a quote what he said um i was bedridden for a few weeks it took me six about six months to recover fully um and at the height of this illness i got out of bed and was attempting to walk to my couch and i fell I fainted dead away, hit my head on the side of a, of a table, a dresser by the bed, and was laying in the floor, you know, um, with, with blood and, and whatever have you. I crawled my way to the couch, and I sat on the couch, and I put my hands in my head like this and just leaned over, and I felt this all-encompassing love, this love beyond any definition is love beyond any explanation a love that needed no questions it, it needed no answers it was just it just was it was just this beingness of love this presence and in that moment i understood that if i were to die i saw like the order of everything i saw how my children's lives were exactly as they were supposed to be and how every step i had ever made was exactly what it was supposed to be and how each interaction I had ever had in my life offered both a gift and a, a lesson, a lesson and a blessing, something, it was all happening for me, not happening to me. And I had this expanded awareness that it was, everything was in the right place, that it was okay, I could, I could die. 
I could go, I could leave, and that everything was all right, and that it was only love. That my whole life, I had experienced a universe of love in the flash of an eye, in the wink of an eye. It, it was this love, and I said to this this light that was enveloping me, this this feeling, I said to it inwardly, I said, if to know you, I must die, let me die, because I was ready to go. I mean. I didn't want to come back at all. You know, I, I mean, it was shocking. Now, I think, you know, you think like, well, here's a guy with kids that he loves and a life he loves and music, and, and none of that was compelling enough. The light was everything. The love was everything. And a voice from this light spoke back to me. And it said, you do not have to die to know me. And I sat up and I opened my eyes and my fever had broken for the first time. I was wringing sweat, like poor drinking the couch, like, like I was in a sauna. And that began my healing. My, I began to get better after that. And I believe and, and, and really truly know to this day, I think if I had said to the light, I want to die to know you, I think I would have died right then. I think I had that choice. I, if I had said, I want to die so I can be there, be with you, I think I would have gone. But I said, if I must die to know you, then I want to die. And the answer was no. You don't have to die to know me. Well, hence the hue. The hue is that thing with me that connects me to that source of that love. Now, that's not to say that every experience is profound like that, but I have had profound experiences like that without having to almost die i've been able to open my heart and consciousness and awareness to that all-embracing love of god for all of us and to experience that and that has had a tremendous effect on how i view my life how i view the life of others the fact that i view you know that life is happening for me not only to me that things happen but there's a, a lesson and a blessing behind them and and being able to see that, increasing my awareness to recognize that, you know, one of the greatest things is to be able to see the blessing while you're still in the fire, you know, hindsight. You know, I went through that experience years ago and now I realize that's great. I have found an increasing ability to recognize the blessing and the gift of the experience while I'm in it. And that has changed the, the character and quality of my life in, in beautiful, dramatic ways. I'm able to to recognize the sacredness of the moment in the smallest of things, not only the grand experience of this inner light, but to see the smile of a child and see God's presence there, to see that in nature, to, to see that with my cat, to see that in, you know, in a city street, to feel that in myriad of ways to recognize that this, this life for me is a, is a gift and to experience gratitude then opens my heart to recognize the blessing. You know, many people receive, if I receive a blessing, I'm grateful for the blessing. And the way it's it's sort of manifesting with me now is I'm grateful and that facilitates my awareness of the blessing. So gratitude first and then the blessing, not the blessing and now I'm grateful. Um, but that, that, that's, that's how he was connected that profound near-death experience to having that same resonance, that same access to that love and expansive consciousness and understanding without having to die. I believe you said that your life is for you. I think that's how you said it. You, you realize that your life is for you. And to me, it's interesting because it kind of implies like then that your life is a gift for you. Yes. Well, that's the, you know, that I've teased my children for years. You know, I said, if I, if I were to, if I were going to have a tombstone, which I won't, I'll, I'll you know, I'll be cremated. But if I were going to have a tombstone, I've told them it's going to say one of two things. The first thing it's going to say is, see, I told you I was sick. <laughs> you know? And the second thing it would say is, everything in life happens for me. Nothing in life happens to me. And that is the lens through which I experience my life, that life is a gift. And that, that the thing that creates the separation is the narrative I tell myself about the journey I have. Um, uh, uh, a great spiritual teacher told me, um, 
You know, Rodney, all souls, all beings on earth experience pain. But suffering is optional. Suffering is what I make the pain mean. The narrative I tell myself about its intention, its purpose. I don't want to experience pain. But I found that by not layering it up with guilt or shame or blame, I'm able to pass through these states much more easily and with greater speed than if I'm holding and you'll say what you what you resist persists. I don't resist those things and I don't I don't push them away. I I'm interested in pulling the weeds from my life, not cutting them down to have them regrow tomorrow or a year from now. I, I want to to know more about who I am, why I'm here, and whose I am. You know, I'm a, I, I, I'm a soul with a body. I'm an eternal soul. Each of us is an eternal soul, deathless, who cannot die, who is loved beyond all measure by God, who's on a journey of unfoldment to experience a greater awareness and to and to give to life to serve not selfish spirituality i'm going to unfold myself and look how great i am but i'm going to let my life be in service to others while i unfold at the same time and that has been a profound thing and then to learn whose i am i am a soul and i am a child of god not to know that as an intellectual understanding but to have an experience an experiential relationship with that consciousness. And Hugh has provided the doorway, the portal, the window, the mirror to see God's actions in my life day by day, to see God's actions through the window in the lives of others, and to walk through that doorway into an expanded room of love and compassion and understanding about my journey, my why of life, you know, my my journey, my my four-year-old granddaughter, uh, Ava, taught me so many wonderful lessons. You know, when I was, in, back in 2017, I had a, a catastrophic injury to my left hand. And for a musician, for a guitarist, that was career-ending, you know. The surgeon told me, the best I can guarantee you is you'll be open, able to open jars and doors. So that was it. A month after my injury, my four-year-old granddaughter became sick and died from sepsis, leaving my daughter and her husband completely devastated, and, and I was completely devastated. Um, when I had my surgery, they gave me general anesthesia, and I was knocked out, and as soon as I went unconscious, my granddaughter came running up to me. Now, she was dead. She came running up to me, and she jumped into my arms, in this other space and said, granddaddy, granddaddy, just like she did in life, you know, when she was here, she said, you can do this, you can do it. And I held her face and it was the most, I mean, I got goosebumps just describing it. It was just this moment of transcendent love that needs no explanation, doesn't need the word love to be love. It was what it was. It was this moment. Well, when I came out of anesthesia after the surgery, the first thing I said to my wife is, I saw Ava, I saw Ava. I told her, and the surgeon came in, I said, I saw Ava, my granddaughter. And he said, it's not possible. Your brain was off. You were completely out. You had, you, you were done. I said, but I saw her. He said, it's not possible. Well, my mind was off, but I'm not my mind. I'm soul. The part of me that is free in the world of God, had this, had entered the space where Ava and I could have that experience. I believe my awareness of that is because I've practiced the hue. I've practiced going to that space. I've practiced being aware in that kind of way. And that created this space where we could have that interaction. And it meant the world to me. It was everything. To this day, it's, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. It was so healing. It was a gift. So yes, that happened for me. My mind was asleep, but as soul, I was awake. And I could remember this transcendent experience with my four-year-old granddaughter that you know, was and is the light of my world. Do your children and family practice, Hugh? 
Yes, my my uh, wife is an Ekis as well. An Ekis is the person who's a member of Ekinkar. When I met her, we've been together 34 years now. Uh, when I met her, she was not. And she used to ask me about Ekinkar, and I said very little about it. And she was like, why won't you really talk to me about Ekinkar much? I said, because Ekinkar is not a club. It's not, I don't want you to join the club because I'm in the club. You know, Each person's spiritual journey is their own. It's sacred. It's between them and God. Even husband and wife, it's sacred. I, I didn't want or assume that her journey was mine. She was a Baptist. And I was okay. God is in the Baptist church too. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't, that was not a problem as long as she didn't mind what I did. You know, it's like, and she didn't. And so it was fine, you know. And she announced to me, you know, maybe after a year and a half, she said to me, just off, matter of fact, like, by the way, I'm an Ekis now. I was like, oh, okay, great. Uh, but I never pressured her or forced her to do that. That was a very personal thing. I mean, being an Ekis is a person really that just is committed to their own journey of unfoldment using a lot of the tools that Ekinkar presents, like the hue and and the spiritual exercises to open their consciousness and be more aware. Um, there's an advanced, you know, spiritual study program, which is, you know, amazing, you know, for, for next to nothing, you know, and I figured it was worth a try. And, uh, but it's not a club. It's not a membership club. You know, you, you have almost a, you, you have as many Ekin cars as there are people in Ekin car because everyone has their own journey in a different way. And the goal with the hue and with spiritual exercises, you know, if you're, if you're making conscious contact with divine spirit and you're supposed to be Jewish, then you'll be the best Jewish person you can be. If you're supposed to be a Buddhist, you'll be the best Buddhist. If you're supposed to be an atheist, you'll live a life filled with love in that way. The idea is to get, to get the maximum relationship, to have the, the deepest journey you can have. In order to get the, get the deepest answers, you go to the deepest source. Well, the deepest source is this this relationship with God and the Holy Spirit. When you have that, then that is the place where all the other decisions are made. Should I be an actress or not? Should I be a Christian or not? Should I practice music? If so, what kind of music? Like those are decisions that I want to make from the deepest, most aware place I can. So rather than say, believe this, it's a doorway to discover what is really dwelling within your heart. You know, I, I did a workshop in Spain from Juilliard some years ago, and there was a gentleman named uh, Carlos who had brought a guitar, and he, you know he came. He looked like Pigpen in the Charlie Brown, you know, cartoons. I mean, he was it was embarrassing, and he was at this workshop, and I taught him and tried to to, to be helpful. I went back the following year, and the guy was immaculate, like it looked like he stepped out of a magazine. His instrument was perfectly cleaned. His, his clothes were pressed. I mean, it was a different person. And at the end of our week there, I said to him, I said, you know, Carlos, look at you. What an amazing transformation. I'm so honored to teach you. And he stepped back and said, no, you did not teach me. And my heart sank because I, I, I cared about this young man. And he just rebuked me and said, you didn't teach me. And then he leaned in and he said, Rodney, he said, a teacher shows me what they know. He said, but you did what a master would do. A master showed me how to find what I know. You reminded me of who I am, what's within me, where the music is within me. And I I realized in that moment, you know, what I had done is the way that I've always worked with any spiritual master, whether it's an Ek master, and there are masters within Ekankar, you know, who are master uh, uh, teachers of spirit, um, never telling me what to believe, but helping me to find what exists within my own heart, helping me to find my path home to God by my own way, to find my own destiny, to to recognize what is my golden contract with spirit? What are the things that I came here to learn? What? How can I do those things? Who did I come to serve? How can I serve those beings? How can I serve with more love? How can I be present in my own life? How can I be the best parent and father and neighbor and friend? To discover that in my own unique way, not by telling me, do this, but by showing me how to find that awareness in myself. And that's what I was mirroring in my own teaching. That's what I mirror to this day in my my music teaching. So, yeah. In Ekankar, do they have centers where everybody go learn together? 
know, kind of like a church or something? Or is it something that you just buy a book and study on your own? Um, well, Ekkar is an individual teaching. I mean, there are what are called satsang classes where you can get together with other like-minded individuals. Like-minded meaning people that are also exploring their own spirituality and who are trying using the tools. You know, so if you're in a room, you say, well, I'm singing you and I'm getting this result. You say, well, have you tried it this way? Or have you tried singing it in, in nature? Or I do it with this way and I'm having this experience or I'm experiencing this with my dreams. It, it's a spiritual laboratory, if you will. Um, there are classes that a person can take, but it's not a requirement. Ekankar is an individual study. It's, it's each individual's journey to unfolding in, in their own relationship with God and spirit. There are churches, temples, if you will. Uh, the main Ekankar temple is in uh, Chanhassen, Minnesota. It's a beautiful building. It's open to the public. It's not a cloistered space at all. It's an open, airy space for anyone who wants to deepen their connection with divine spirit. There are some Ekankar centers. Most areas, uh, most urban areas in the United States will have uh, an Ekankar center or maybe a, a, a place to go. But it's always a zero pressure, zero proselytizing, zero coercion zone. You know, there's no there's no imperative to make anyone believe anything uh, in Ekankar. The idea is to share, to share this teaching, this wonderful, amazing gift of of finding oneself and everyone else decides what's right for them. You know, that, that, but there are wonderful uh, discourses that, that have walked me through, you know, like how to explore my world of dreams, how to, how to, you know, how to read my own dreams, not, not like a dream dictionary, but how to understand the way that I use dreams. How do, how do dreams speak to me? What's my own internal language? How do I discover that? Um, you know, the, that, that's a real been a real gift to me. So yes, there are classes that a person can take, and there's an advanced spiritual study program that a person could take, which just offers deeper applications of the spiritual techniques for for each individual. And then there are the books. But I think you know every person should take their own pace and decide what's right for them. You know, and and do what what feels right. That's the most important. You know, you 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 check with your heart. Check with your your gut what seems like the right thing and do that as long as it's centered in love if someone's just interested you know for some basic information where is a good starting point is it from a book or do they have a website where you can just yeah start i running? would go to uh, thank you i didn't mean to interrupt you uh, right. uh, i would go to uh, gift of hue it's gift the word gift of hue all one word gift of hue dot uh dot org and there's lots of information about the hue that you can get there. You know, just re you can read stuff like that. It'll also there are also books that you can get. and They're available on Amazon, and they're available from that website as well. And you know, just read and see how it feels. You know, see if it makes sense. You know, I, I like I always have always felt. You know, it's not true because it's in the book. It's in the book because it's true. And the truth has to be something that you recognize within yourself. You know, you don't have to accept that as being true. You. You try, you know, you don't have to believe what I say about the hue, sing the hue, but like everything else, practice makes better. So, you know, if you sing hue two days and get no result, it's like going to the gym two days and getting no result. I mean, it requires a little more skin in the game than that, you know, but if you, if it's at all interesting, you give it a try, see how it feels, see what you experience and then take your next step from there. When you sing hue, how long do you think people should sing it for, at least in the beginning? Um, I mean, I think you probably, uh, maybe 15 minutes a day. Um, but you could sing you walking. You could sing you as a spiritual exercise. You could start, you know, with, with two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, and build it up. And then followed by, by just quiet contemplation. You know, you're singing you, you're opening up this doorway, uh, really opening up the awareness of the doorway that exists between you and divine spirit, this flow of spirit and love. And then listening to, you know, it's like you're singing a love song to God and you listen in silence as God sings back to you. It's that kind of experience. I've had that experience of hearing the, you know, what's referred to as the music of the spheres and, and this kind of beautiful otherworldly, music that, that defies description that no artist nothing i can do can 
imitate or mirror that. Um, but I've been able to experience that, you know. Uh, but describing that is like trying to describe, you know, the taste of an apple. I mean, the best way to know the taste of an apple is to do what? Is to bite an apple. Then you know something that no words can convey. Likewise with the hue, no matter what I say about it, when you sing it and, and try it and work with it for, you know, a week or two or a month or whatever have you, then you know. And you know if it's for you and you know if it, if it feels like you're... Like it's something to include in your life's journey. And if not, then nothing ventured, nothing gained. You know, you you, you tried something that, that didn't cost you anything and you didn't get a result. Or you tried something that didn't cost you anything and OMG, everything is different. Like that. You mentioned dreams. Is a lot of Ekankar about interpreting your dreams? It's about being aware of dreams. You know, dreams in, in the Ek teachings are considered... Uh, real experiences, often the jumbled nature it has to do with the way our mind interprets what we're experiencing in the same way that if you look at the moon through a, a dark, you know, a, a dirty telescope, you say, oh, it's a cloudy day, I can hardly see anything, and then someone looks like, oh, it's a clear day, and there's the moon. It's like that with dreams, you know, that the more I have practiced being aware of dreams, I keep a dream journal and write down things, uh, that has helped me to be, I've told myself, I've told my, the soul that I am has told, informed my mind, hey, pay attention to your dreams, they're important. So the mind eventually gets on board, it's like, oh, we want to pay attention to dreams? Okay, great. So now it stays on when I dream and I can wake up and write things down or remember things as a result. But yeah, dreams are a wonderful way to experience these inner what are called inner worlds of God, inner planes, higher worlds of God. Yeah, all that is part part of it, depending on, on what's needed. You know, the 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 wonderful thing for about Eck for me is that it unifies all the different aspects of spirituality. So synchronicities, astral travel, dream travel, um, you know, coincidences, deja vu, intuition, you know, uh nudges, all these sort of things that occur, suddenly insights and, you know, out-of-body travel. I always wanted to know the why of the, like, because any one of those could be a lifetime of study. You could take any one of those things I mentioned and say, all right, I'm going to go full on with this and spend the rest of my life studying that and, and learning about that. What Ekankar does is say that all those, has shown me that all of those pieces are conspiring to this other part, this for me part which is to help me unfold spiritually, to help me take my next spiritual step, to help me grow. And so they're all lenses that can do that. They're not, they're not ends into themselves, but they're aspects of divine truth that each offers an insight, a gift, a step. You know, you can't climb a mountain that's smooth. And so I've learned to reinterpret the obstacles of my life as being the stepping stones to learn something, to grow, to give more, to serve more. And dream travel is part of that, where you can be aware in your dreams. Uh, similar to lucid dreaming, with with the, you know, with the expansive vision of so many different uh, wonderful aspects of these inner worlds of, of spirit that are not as encumbered as this physical world is. With this, the place where the light comes. Obviously, you believe in reincarnation because you've experienced your past life. Um, I'll just put two questions out there for you. One, does Eck teach about reincarnation? And two, for the big picture, what is the point of us coming back over and over again, in your opinion? Well, yeah, I do. I wouldn't say I believe. I mean, I know about reincarnation because I remember some of my lives. So it's not, for me, it's not a belief. Um, you know, Ekankar embraces that, that soul makes many journeys into the world of flesh to gain experiences to unfold, you know, and to, uh, to grow in love and service and to unfold into mastery, to spiritual mastery, to, to become the captain of your own ship, 
you know, not to become an impersonal atom of God, but to become a conscious co-worker with God, which means to do God's work. I always say, you know, spirit will guide those who are willing and drag the rest, you know, so it's a way to not get dragged, you know, to, to not be dragged through life, but to have this willing relationship, conscious relationship with divine spirit. Um, what was the second half of your question? So you kind of already answered it, but I was just wanting to know with your own life experiences, including your what you've learned from Eck, in your opinion, why do you think we keep coming back over and over again? Well, that's, that is the question of all time, isn't it? You know, isn't that the, the question? Why are we here? Who are we? Why are we here? What does it all mean? Um, and I think that's something worthy of each of us spending a lifetime to answer if that's what it takes. It doesn't take a lifetime. You know, I, I know from my own journey that, you know, I came here to learn uh, who I am, that I'm a soul. I came here to learn whose I am, that I'm a soul in the arms of God. And I came here to serve others in the same understanding. Hence, I'm on this podcast. That that is the, that I came here to, to grow and unfold and to learn and to give. That where I am planted is where I can serve the best, serve the most. And that sometimes, you know, see, the, the most fertile soil, soil is the darkest. Sometimes just because everything's dark doesn't mean it's not nurturing. It just means that I have to sprout through it. And uh, I, I've learned that each of us, uh, you know, each of us, our story matters. Our journey matters. The things we say, the things we do, the love we give, the thoughts we hold, it matters. That all of us are important to God. All of us are children of spirit. All of us are worthy of unfolding and of, of a deeper awareness and understanding of this abiding love that's present. If if I can learn to be more aware of it and experience it and be a, a pipe open on both ends so the love flows in, the love flows out. I've learned that sometimes my journey is to be, to receive a gift for someone else, that the gift isn't through me for someone else. It's not for me. And to be willing to, to let Spirit use me to assist someone, but I always get kissed on the, when the Spirit flows. I, I'm always kissed as it flows on the way out, you know. I've learned that my life and the lives of all humans, all souls, is a great love story. It's a love story, and like all great love stories, it has an arc of up and down and success and failures and redemption and freedom and not, you know, it has this arc that all the great love stories from the beginning of time have. But in the end, it's a love story. And moment by moment, it's a love story. It's this, it's the love of God pouring out so that I can gradually unfold, gradually awaken, gradually learn to give more, to serve more, to experience a greater portion of the divine love it's present in all the worlds. And so the phenomenon of where it is and if it's in this inner world or it's this spiritual teacher or this, that, is not as important as being the channel, being the, a willing vehicle, a willing participant in my own unfoldment, to be to grow into being a spiritual adult, you know, to 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 take that and to to learn from how to be the, the the best human being and the best spiritual being I can, that my humanity and my divinity are not at odds. I want my humanity to be in service to God the same way I want my divinity to be in service to God. That unfolding is not something to do only alone by myself. It's something to do in the depths of my being, but to serve all. You know, that I will learn as much or more by so you know when you row a, someone you know in a boat across a river to get to the an island, you get there yourself. You know when you shine a flashlight for someone else to see in the dark, you also can see. And so I've learned that by serving, you you can help in that way. You know that that um, we're all walking each other home. And by different paths. Some are going different. Some people are in that car, some are not. Some are in this or not. I want to share one story, if I may, one sure. story that, that emphasizes this point. You know, I, I played guitar for years with a group called the Manhattan Transfer. They're a singing jazz group. They were very popular. And, and we did a tour of Europe, ending in the Ukraine, of all places, uh, in Kiev. And I flew back. And, you know, it was an arduous flight. We flew from Kiev to 
Helsinki, Finland and Helsinki, Finland to Kennedy Airport. And, you know, by the time I got home, lights out, I was done. I was completely exhausted, you know. Went to bed maybe 11, 12 at night. And at three in the morning, I heard a voice say to me, go see John. And I sat up in bed. You know, my wife had sound asleep. You know, I sat up in bed. It's like, what? What just happened? And I heard it again. Like, I'm up now. And I heard it. Go see John. And then I sat there. I've learned to pay attention through singing to Hugh. I've learned that, you know, these kind of things, I should pay attention to this. Like, you know, and I, I was like, John, who do I know that's John? What? And the person that kept coming to mind was a young man I had known. He was maybe 28, 29 years old who had been injured in a car accident and was paralyzed from the neck down and lived in a rehab facility with a, you know, a, a machine that breathed for him. And I hadn't seen him in, you know, four years or so. But no matter how I tried, you know, I, I, I laid back down. I was like, John, no, it just, he kept coming to me, John, John, John. So like I say, you know, when, when I receive guidance like that, if I get a, a clear nudge, because I practice listening to that, you know. So I got up, took a shower, and drove about an hour into New Jersey to where John was in this nursing facility, nursing home. I went into the building. I didn't see a soul. The door was unlocked. I didn't see any nurses, no doctors, no patients, nothing. I went up. I, I, somehow I went up to the third floor. I found his room. You know, I don't know if I, I don't know, even remember now how I knew that that was, but I went to the third floor and his room was there. I went in his room and he was, seemed to be asleep. You know, I mean, he was just laying, you know, could, nothing could move. He was laying there, his eyes closed. And I sat beside his bed and I just opened my heart in gratitude and I sang Hugh. Now, I didn't sing you to get a result. I didn't sing you to make anything happen. I sang you just to open my heart to love, to be love for him, just to be love, not even to give love, to be, to let this, this hue flow through me for whatever spirit wants to do. When I opened my eyes, maybe it was 10 minutes later, you know, he was looking at me and tears were pouring down his face. And before I could say anything to him, he said, how did you know? And he repeated it again. I was speechless. He said, how did you know? And then the machine breathed for him and he said, Rodney, I've been sitting here day after day for years saying to God, I have no purpose. I have no meaning. I can't move my hands. I can't move my arms or my legs. I can't breathe for myself. I can't feed myself. I lay here every day. And I can't just can't do it. And so I said to God last night before I went to sleep, God, I will only ask one more time. Spirit, if you hear me, if you are with me, send someone, show me. I won't ask again. He said, today is my birthday. And I decided, if after these years, if I got no answer, if I'm just speaking to nothing, if nobody's listening, I just want to die. And today's my birthday, and I open my eyes, and you're here. How did you know? And I said to him, John, Spirit, God, sent me to you to tell you that you're never alone and that God hears every heartbeat, every murmur of your spirit, every dream and wish that you hold, God hears that. Spirit is with you and hears that. 
I'm here to tell you that I'm here for that. You're never alone. And that you can't, not doing a lot is not a limiting thing. You can be love. You don't have to do love. You can be love. You can be of service. You can serve the others here like yourself by being love. He knew about singing the hue. I said, you can sing the hue. You can connect with this love and let it flow through you. It will flow through you to them. You can serve as a channel for that love. God sent me here to tell you that. And now, by this time, he's weeping. I'm weeping. And I share the story for this reason. Singing the hue, opening my heart to God's love, is not a thing of selfishness. It's not, it's not just for me. I recognize in that moment what's at stake when I don't listen. What if I had said, oh, go see John. I'll, I'll do that tomorrow or the next day. or Oh, who's John anyway? I'm tired. But through singing the hue, for trusting the process, I learned to answer that call, to listen louder and respond. And because I did, I could not have known what it would mean to this soul, this man, who said, this is my birthday and this is the last day I'm going to ask God to help me. And I recognize that singing the hue was not just for me. It's a way of giving service to life. It's a way of understanding my own journey and serving others. And that has given my life a real meaning and purpose to unfold spiritually and to help others do the same, to be a light in dark places, to allow the light and love of God to flow through me as it will not directed by me and to learn to listen louder to the nudges the intuitions the small things the small ways God speaks to a child you know it could be through anything through a newspaper through a, something on television through a friend through a relative but to pay attention because what's at stake is not just my own awareness. It could be giving service to someone who so desperately and badly needed it. John has gone on to do very well. He found his why. He found his purpose. He realized that he could be love and that there was nothing that could ever prevent that. That he was not limited by his physical limitations in his heart is being. So we learned a both we both learned a very valuable lesson that day about what the hue is. It's connecting to the divine essence of God, the love of God, and learning to be a channel for that in the life I live, day by day, month by month, year by year. And one thing I know, Jeff, is this. Wherever I'm going, God is already there. And that's enough. Well, that is a perfect ending to the podcast. I don't even know how to go beyond that. It was so great. But I wanted to ask you a few things before we finish up. Are you working on anything or is there anything that you would like to promote personally? No. No, not really. I, I, uh, I mean, I'm a musician, you know, I'm a known entity, you know, one, one can Google my name, you'll, you'll see what I do and stuff like that. And, but uh, no, I'm not here to promote anything. I'm here to just to share, to share my story, you know, to share if any of it is helpful, that's it. Uh, you know, I'm not here to make anyone believe anything or to promote, to sell anything. I'm here just to share my journey. That's it. I knew that from the beginning. I just thought, you know, I would do something nice for you in return. And thought, okay, maybe you have, you're working on a musical piece or a CD or something that you would just like to mention before we go. Well, not so much. I mean, if you Google me, you'll see what's going on.
I didn't mention to you this in the beginning, and I'm nowhere near the caliber of musician you are. I used to just play, and I was always more like a play in bars and clubs, like as a cover band. But I wanted to see if this is something that you've ever experienced. It's happened a few times, not all the time, but sometimes when the music is really tight, um, the crowd is great, everything, the energy seems great, it's almost like I have a like, spiritual experience, and I almost feel like as if I even become the music. Yes. It doesn't even last throughout an entire song. You just get this glimpses of like a static feeling. Have you ever experienced that? Absolutely, and that is... That's one of the compelling things, you know, about music. Uh, but it requires the willingness to open the heart like that. You'd be amazed of wonderful musicians who don't go to that place. And and musicians who are not trained and not, you know, masters of music, but who can go to that place. It's a quality of being. But yes, you know, for uh, for the musician, uh, and this is something that, that I have experienced, you know, to go from playing the instrument to being the instrument, you know, where the music begins to flow through, um, flow through me, not being from me. And I begin to play not just what I want to say, but the music that I play is what I want to hear. That's a different uh, thing. And yeah, it's one of the transcendent things. It's one of the reasons that many jazz musicians had such difficult journeys, you know, during the, the, the you know, the golden era of jazz, because you have musicians that were dealing with, you know, all kind of social issues and oppression and, and racism and et cetera, et cetera. And when they would play music, they would experience this ecstatic, beautiful state. And then when they would come back to their earthly life, they were dealing with, you can't stay in this hotel, you can't travel here, you know, this is the way life is. And that led them to then quench that pain with however they quench the pain, whatever substances or whatever have you. One of the things that Hugh does is it bring it for me it provides balance it it lets me bring the resonance of this inner god's love this inner ecstatic state and to bring that into my working daily life i, I there's not as a dramatic fall off you know so if i'm not i'm not walking around you know seeing you know the white light i can't you know no i can't talk to you i can't order any food because i'm in this state it's not like that but the resonance the the remembrance, my heart knows the way. My heart knows the way to that place because I've practiced that. And so that resonance sticks with me during my daily life. It sticks with me in my relationship. It, it's something that's always there. And I'm so deeply grateful for that. It's, it's, made, uh, it's made my life go from black and white to being color. You know, it's made the, the, the quality of my life be this rich, deep, beautiful, colored palette of everyone's journey and everyone's experience not idealized i know that the world has problems and i know that there's some people that are really great but you know i i look at people i say you know i can love you and there's nothing you can do about it the love is what i am inside it's not what you do and i know who you are even if you don't know who you are and so that's my responsibility to to be love even if the person doesn't know that they are love all right rodney before we finish up You've given us lots of positive messages, but can you give us one more? For me, the goal of my life has always been this. To live a life so that when the pure light of God shines upon me and through me, it would cast no shadow. And this was influenced by my father, this wonderful man of God, Christian minister, who as a child... Uh, he would do a sermon in Nashville, Tennessee, and then the sermon maybe was 20 minutes, and he would stand on the steps of the church for an hour or two, hugging every little old lady that came up. He was a handsome man, and all the old lady, little church ladies would come up and want to hug him, and he would touch their face like this and talk about their grandchildren. Just everyone got there five or ten minutes. Well, as a little child, this drove me crazy. I wanted to get home and go eat, so I'm tagging, tugging up my father's robe, and and then one day he got down on one knee and he looked me right in my eyes. And this changed my whole life. He said, son, for many of these people, when I talk to them, when I put my hands on their face, when I listen, it's the only time someone ever lets them know that they are loved. It's the only time someone ever tells them that they matter. It's the only time someone ever takes the 
an interest in their journey. He said, son, they don't come for the sermons. They come for the hugs. And I recognized what being God's love was in that moment. I got it. I was six, seven years old. Understood. He was being love on the steps of the church for these people. The words were the words, and they were great. He was a great speaker. But greater than that was to stand before these people and let them know that they were loved. And I said, you know, in my journey through life, in music, in all that I do, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. I want that to be the most important thing. That whatever I do helps someone to recognize that they are loved and that they are love itself. Rodney, thank you for that message. And thank you again for being my guest today. Really appreciate you. And I wish you the best. Thank you. It's an honor. Thanks for all the work you do for the way that you're serving life and the love that you give and the love that you share. It really matters, Jeff. Your story really matters. You're, you're, you know, you're a beautiful channel for love and light in this world. I'm grateful for all that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.